Well, welcome back to the workshop, to the second part of this session, of this session challenges of digitalization. How can we measure its impact in the economy? We have a great uh, panel composed by, f starting from, from there, by Celestino Giron. He is principal econ economist at the European Central Bank. He has developed a career in financial statistics, national accounts, and flow of <coughs> funds analysis, having worked as a statistician at the ECB and at the Banco de España. Uh, he, is also, or he also uh, worked as analyst at the ECB and the Spanish Fiscal Council. In the middle, we have uh, Dylan Ras Rasier. He is a Chief of National Accounts Research at the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis. He leads a team of professional economists who work on measurement improvements for aspects of digital economy and globalization. Their portfolio of work includes free internet connect, valuation of data, depreciation of high-tech capital goods, accounting for intangible assets, and location of production and income within multinational firms. Finally, here right to me, uh, we have Elias Alvagli. Elias is the director of Central Bank of Chile's Monetary Policy Division since June <coughs> of, of uh, last year. He holds a bachelor degree in business and master's <coughs> in financial economics from the Catholic University of Chile, and he received his PhD in economics from Harvard University. So each of you have uh, 25 minutes, and at the end we, we will have some time for uh, questions from the floor. So thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the Banco Central de Chile for inviting me and giving the opportunity to talk to you to such a relevant audience. Well, the, the title of my talk is Data Statistics on Central Bank, so I will try to, of course, discuss about the digital transformation as close as possible to central bank activities. Most of us are central bankers, so as much as possible closer to our heart. But you will <coughs> see that, very, uh, that at the end of the day, I will talk about really general things because most aspects of the digital transformation affect central bank activities. So I decided to start my presentation with a quote from Steven Soderberg. This is not a central banker, he's not a statistician, he's not an economist, he's not a data digitalization guru or anything. This is a movie maker, he's a film director. The quote is, you are supposed to expand your mind to fit the art, you are not supposed to chop the art down to fit your mind. So the question is why I have chosen this. Well, I can give you perhaps two answers to that. The first one is that there is a weird coincidence between the title of my presentation and the title of the best movie of this director, which is my presentation is Data Statistics and Central Bank. And the most famous movie from Steven Soderbergh is Sex, Lies, and Videotape. <laughs> it's just the reason. I mean, I'm not implying that there is any relationship between Central Bank and videotapes less so between data and sex, perhaps a little bit between statistics and lies that I might recognize. But really the, the reason is because I thought that perhaps it fits very well into the way we should approach uh, the challenge of the digital economy as statisticians um, in the sense that uh, we have to perhaps try to expand our system, to expand our mind, to accommodate the new elements, to accommodate the art. Rather than doing uh, the other approach, we would be trying to fit the new things that are appearing into a framework that might not be appropriate for it. So that's why I like this um, quote and how, what is the relation that I find with what we are going to discuss. In. Although it's also true that for some of the occasions, for some of the aspects of the digital transformation, this is actually not applicable, and we'd rather do the second part of the quote, chopping the art down to fit the system. We will discuss that in, in a few minutes. 
Um, my presentation is going to be organized as, as you see here. So first, um, I think it's a good idea to spend a few minutes to refresh our minds on what are the central bank functions. You all know that. Most of you are central bankers. But in relation see, with the digital uh, transformation, and also in relation to the challenges related to that from the statistical point of view. And then I have chosen four uh, specific areas. I could have chosen others just to discuss a little bit the aspect of central banking. Crypto assets. There was the thread this morning that we might enter a discussion on crypto assets, so perhaps this is the opportunity. Um, alternative finance that I call here shadow fintech. And then two issues related to the productivity puzzle. One is the measurement of data. At the end, we all want to repeat ourselves, and I'm also going to say something about data. The last one is something that you will see at the end of my presentation is whether we are getting it right in terms of registering value added in terms of time profile. It will be clear when I come there what I actually mean. So what, are, what, are, what is the impact of the digital transformation in central bank functions? Well, I have listed a few items. The digital transformation has an impact on the way uh, prices are formed. One might argue that the, the process of uh, um, price changes will be faster, perhaps more accurate in a way, but also perhaps more volatile. So as central bankers, we are we care about inflation. We are very much worried about that. It has an obvious impact on productivity, perhaps not the way we were expecting, but it has it. And therefore, on an equilibrium rate of interest, real rate of interest, that of course is crucial for a central banker. It might distort the transmission mechanism, the way policy measures end up affecting prices, quantities, interest rate. As central bankers, we are very much concerned about that. The same way that we are concerned about the possibility of having new sources of liquidity and credit in the system coming from the digital transformation, or possible threats to financial stability coming from crypto assets or from some other areas of alternative finance. The same way that we are uh, concerned about uh, what is the impact on payment systems and perhaps on market infrastructure. Uh, these are related to the functions of the uh, central banker. And there are a number of statistical problems related to that. I have chosen three big ones that encompass some others of a smaller scale. The first one is, uh, do we as a statistician distinguish correctly price, volume, quantity, and, quant and quality, which will affect basically these two areas of central bank activity? The second big question is, do we measure productivity or output and factors correctly, which will affect, of course, uh, the uh, real rate of interest, but also distortion to the transmission mechanism. And the last big question is, are we covering the new uh, financial objects out there? Do we have a correct covering of alternative finance affecting all these elements that, I, that I'm enclosing in the last diagram. So that, that would be the introduction. This is, this is the effect of the digital transformation in um, central bank activities. And I'm now moving to the first uh, item that I have chosen, crypto assets. The, the first question that one asks himself or herself as central banker is to which extent is this, this is relevant compared to many other things that are affecting central bank bankers as uh, we are interested about asset liabilities, uh, financing, uh, credit, uh, liquidity. Is this that important at the end of the day? Well, the question perhaps is not where it is important now, it's where it is be important in a few years. And what is certain is that the, the way we look at crypto assets or cryptocurrencies have changed quite dramatically in the last year. Like one year ago, we were talking about crypto winter, it seems that the value of this is Bitcoin, the price in uh, US dollars, was declining. And perhaps we were in the, all this story about cryptocurrencies was not so relevant. But this has changed recently. And now prices are still going up. I must say that in the last days, this, this was prepared on the 19th of September. And the last day is again going down. I didn't check it this morning. 
Uh, but still, I mean, the overall trend of uh, price increase in prices is still holding. Um, but I found this, this is taken from a blog, I mean, something called investing in blockchain. Uh, the periodic table of cryptocurrency. There is not uh, that funny because there are many people that are now doing this. I mean, they, they, you have periodic tables about many things. But I find this one on cryptocurrency is interesting to illustrate how complex this world seems to be. Complex and kind of confusing because there are many terms around when one is approaching this for the first time. Things like digital money, I don't know, tokens, blockchain, DLT, decentralized RTGS, altcoins, what is all that? I mean, uh, as a rational accountant, which is what I am, my question is what, what is really important here? What is what we need to measure? And I'm going to provide you four clarification points to try to resolve this question. What is what we need to measure there? One, is, one that is perhaps surprising is that the technology doesn't matter when one is facing a digital object and deciding whether there is an asset behind or not, or whether this is a new payment system or a new platform, what really matters are other things. I mean, if one is looking into blockchain to see there is a crypto asset there, well, you should know that blockchain might be supporting things that are not even financial. It might be just um, logistics or things like that. What is then what it matters? What it matters is the asset boundary. So coming back to the quote from Steven Soderbergh at the beginning, uh, here you better try to chop the art down to feed your mind rather than expanding your mind, because we already have a definition for that. And only those things that are really store of value or representing a benefit, I'm just quoting this from SNA, that is what should matter. What should matter the most? Everything is interesting. I'm now taking the view of uh, central bank and perhaps whether there is an asset, create a liquidity is more important than other things. The other thing, the other uh, point for clarification is that please never use the word cryptocurrency. These are not cryptocurrency because they are not currency. In 99.9% of the cases, because again, our mind says that unless there is a claim against a central bank, we cannot properly talk about currency. So I would suggest, and most of us would agree with that, that we rather use the term crypto asset, which is the one that I have chosen there. And the last point for clarification is that what really, really matters is whether, well, first, whether there is an asset or not, or whether there is a store of value. And the second one is what, which model of asset you have there whether you, uh, you have something that is following the traditional asset liability model, so there is a claim against anyone, someone is committed to provide the cash flow in the future, or whether there is nothing like that, which is, would be the typical case of Bitcoin and other so-called cryptocurrencies, also we, we have said that this uh, terminology is perhaps not right. So that takes us to a very simple taxonomy. There are others a little bit more complicated, but at the end of the day, what matters is whether there is an asset liability model where well, you can identify someone that is paying a cash flow in the future on the basis of that claim. Can be supported by a DLT or blockchain or anything like that. But what really matters is that there is a liability, an agent that is identifiable as uh, the liability agent. And those are to be treated as financial assets, and our system is perfectly capable to cover them. It could be, the most, in most cases, it will be securities, but in principle, it could be deposits or loans or something like that. And the second big group is, and we suggest at the ECB to call it like that, crypto assets, not to the first one, to the second one, which would be the Bitcoin model, where there is no issuing agent. There is a definition there, but many other definitions can be used asset evidence by the centralized chain of digital signatures insured by a cryptographic technologies. So the question here is how to treat them. Uh, well, the OECD and the IMF is discussing about that. The AEG says something about uh, the first half of the year and how to treat it. 
I must be careful here because the, the AEG is the Advisory Expert Group on National Accounts, is that they are discussing right now as we speak uh, on possible other treatments, but what we said at the beginning of the year is that they should be as produced non financial asset valuables. Well, the problem there is that, from my point of view, and this is not the ECB speaking, it's me, is that if these uh, objects become really um, a means of payment, any payment done through them would not be reflected in the lending of borrowing, and this is probably something we don't want. As I said, the AG is looking into the subject now, and perhaps it will look into the subject of the future again, but I'm now suggesting uh, some other options beyond this uh, produce non-financial assets option. One could be to treat it as a financial asset without liabilities, which is the case of gold. Gold is an exception in the system, but once you have an exception, you can have two, why not? The other one is to set up a new category, something in between non-financial assets and financial assets, where these guys would go, crypto assets, and gold would go. But once you open this Pandora box, then you might start thinking about some other possibilities, like, yeah, non produced non financial assets, or even things like equity, and this would be a little bit more disturbing. But equity, you can see them also as assets without liabilities. Well, of course, you have the company that is issuing, but they are not obliged to provide you any cash flow in the future, only in case there are profits and only if they decide to, de to send dividends. Well, this is all about the theoretical framework, then the conceptual framework. Then the most challenging thing is actually how to obtain data on crypto assets. I'm not going to spend much time here, but perhaps uh, I would uh, advise you to look into what the ECB is doing in the area in this document by Chimienti and others, colleagues of mine. Uh, here, just in case you want to read it, uh, when you have the copy of the presentation, you have a summary of what is there, but I would recommend that you go there and you look into it. Now, the second uh, item I wanted to discuss is the alternative finance. I call it shadow fintech. Uh, you know what, is, what I'm talking about here is objects like peer-to-peer -peer lending, crowdfunding, royalty-based financing, and all these new elements that are supported by something that is called fintech, but it's not the same as fintech. Fintech, again, makes a reference to technology, and as I have said before, technology doesn't really matter. What matters is the relationship between economic agents. Uh, and also something that is not equal to alternative finance is shadow banking. Uh, you know, any banking activity that is taking forms different to traditional banking? This is not what we are talking about, but it is true that some of the activities here might be following under the category of shadow banking. Uh, it's funny because when I was writing there, they said, uh, is these finance models might put be similar to those of traditional shadow banking. I never thought that I could be in a position to put traditional close to shadow banking because traditional was attached usually to normal banking. But now we are in a situation where we have also traditional shadow banking that is not fintech enhance. Um, I'm going to skip this because it's again about the data that is needed and I would just like you to pay attention to the work of the IFC working group on fintech data that is the one that is trying to give responses to the question how to get data on alternative finance and other digital enhanced financial objects. Data. Again, repeating what others have said, databases are in the system, but data is another thing. Data also shows up as a part of goodwill when the data that a company has been building up during his life when it's sell in a, it's sold in a acquisition or a mergers. And also very important, as someone from the floor said this morning, um, data value is already there. Uh, if it has a value, someone is paying for it, uh, the economy is efficient, and there is an income somewhere in the, uh, in some corner of the accounts accounting for it. So we better be, be careful because it might be that we, if we really treat to merge that data separately, that we are.
Can I use this one? I just use this one. That's okay. So, um, well, the question is whether this the coverage in the accounts now is sufficient in the new context where the database business are more and more important. And that's where there is a debate. I mean, we can discuss about that. But um, yeah, I have prepared kind of a tree of alternatives here. Um, um, where data could be seen as produced by corporations or are provided by households. And in the case that is provided by households, one can see them as non-produced assets or as produced services or data or assets that are then sold to uh, corporations. Um, the only thing that I wanted to say here is that uh, I have, and this is my personal, uh, my personal uh, view on the subject, is that um, some of this model entail the vision that households are producing something that is then sold to companies. Data is produced by households and sold to companies. Uh, I have a problem to see it like that because I'm kind of old fashioned in what should go to GDP. GDP should cover things that are taxable. And it's going to be very difficult for me to be convinced that when I'm spending time in the internet surfing or looking for a flight, I'm subject to taxation. Although, yeah, I mean, we, and we have to be careful because if we statisticians say that there is income there, then the policy, the, the politician will come next and actually try to taxate my time in the internet. So I don't think this is really reflecting anything that is happening in the traditional way we see GDP. Of course, as we have said this morning a few times, uh, other measures of welfare might include these activities, but we should be extremely careful to have it in GDP. Now, the last thing that I wanted to spend a few times was actually, a few minutes, was actually uh, inspired by a very recent article from uh, Barrow called Double Counting of Investment. This was in May, I think. Uh, and there is a, a statement there, I mean, uh, actually the uh, article goes about that, which says the basic structure of national income and product accounts features double counting of investment. The double counting leads to overstatement of levels of aggregate as GDP and income. So what is what Barrow is saying? I mean, this is something that the national accounts are aware of for many years. The only thing is that we decided to ignore it. It's not that we are not aware of that. And I'm trying to explain myself. The question, uh, put in other words, is does value added equal consumption in the long run? This is what Barrow is trying to say when he says that there is double counting of investment because he claims that this is not happening. An example would help us see this. Imagine that. A uh, company has to satisfy a stream of consumption in, let's say, 16 periods from now, 16 years, amounting to 100 units. This is what you see reflected there in accumulated terms. So this is starting with zero. Consumption goes up to 100 over the long time horizon. How is this treated in terms of value recording in national accounts? Let's imagine that for producing these 100 uh, monetary unions of consumption, the company that is providing it needs to do some research or development at the beginning by an amount of 40. Would be recorded at that point in time, at the beginning, in just one year, 40. What happens from then on in terms of gross value added, in terms of gross domestic product? It happens this, is that the production of uh, the units of consumption is following exactly the same a slope of consumption leading to an over, overestimation of total value of 40. That's the observation from Barrow. As I said, national accountants account we are aware of that, and actually we have another way of accounting for value which we call net value added. So we are depreciating the investment at the beginning and including as a cost of production during the life of the particular good or services we are referring to. So that at the end of the period, value is actually the same value, net value, is exactly the same as um, consumption. 
But Barrow is telling uh, something else if you read the article uh, carefully. Is that the value of uh, research and development at the beginning is actually underestimated and it should rather be the uh, current present value of the income associated to the research and development effort, which would give us this sort of trajectory, still reaching uh, the equivalence between production of value and consumption, but with a different um, pattern. Uh, this is, again, something the statisticians are aware of. Uh, even the system of national accounts is, is dealing with something called capital service approach in the it's not exactly the way Barros is presenting, but you can bridge from one to the other quite nicely. So what is the relation between all this and the digital transformation? The following thing. This difference between uh, Barros' approach or the capital service approach in the evaluation of assets and what we have in the accounts, is well, this, this difference is not in our um, measurement of value. So. What if this gap is, is this gap is actually increasing as the digital transformation is progressing? What if we had a fundamental mistake in the way the profile of value generation is depicted? It was there since the beginning. It's only that the digital transformation is making now evident. So it's not that we have some product from products, services, or goods and services that we are not covering is that the way we were covering was always wrong, quote unquote, and that um, this process of transition is making it evident. So that was basically what I wanted to show to you. I mean, uh, this is a summary of the messages that I've been passing through. One is that, uh, while well, central bank activities are very much affected by digital transformation, we need good data and good concepts that there is a particular attention to be paid to crypto assets and other alternative finance because financial stability and also the transmission mechanism might be very much affected. Database might be, the database business might be underestimated, but still we have to be careful because in some point of view, this is already included in GDP and we have to be careful not to have double counting. And the, first, and the last thing is that perhaps we have to reactivate this capital service approach because th that can give us a complementary uh, view on how value e evolves in time that would be a contribution to answering the question of why productivity is declining. Perhaps productivity is declining because we always had a problem with the way we were reflecting again the temporal path of value generation. And this transformation time is making it evident. Thank you.